Chapter 39 Deals with Weddings Anne felt that life partook of the nature of an anticlimax during the first few weeks after her return to Green Gables. She missed the merry comradeship of Patty's place. She had dreamed some brilliant dreams during the past winter, and now they lay in the dust around her. In her present mood of self-disgust, she could not immediately begin dreaming again. And she discovered that, while solitude with dreams is glorious, solitude without them has few charms. She had not seen Roy again after their painful parting in the park pavilion, but Dorothy came to see her before she left Kingsport. "'I'm awfully sorry you won't marry Roy,' she said. "'I did want you for a sister, but you're quite right. It would bore you to death. I love him, and he is a dear sweet boy, but he really isn't a bit interesting. He looks as if he ought to be, but he isn't.' "'This won't spoil our friendship, will it, Dorothy?' Anne had asked wistfully. "'No, indeed. You're too good to lose. If I can't have you for a sister, I mean to keep you as a chum anyway. But don't threat over Roy. He's feeling terrible just now. I have to listen to his outpourings every day. But he'll get over it. He always does.' "'Oh, always,' said Anne, with a slight change of voice. "'So he has got over it before?' "'Dear me, yes,' said Dorothy frankly. "'Twice before, and he raved to me just the same both times. Not that the others actually refused him. They simply announced their engagements to someone else. Of course, when he met you, he vowed to me that he'd never really loved before, that the previous affairs had been merely boyish fancies. But I don't think you need to worry.' Anne decided not to worry. Her feelings were a mixture of relief and resentment. Roy had certainly told her she was the only one he had ever loved. No doubt he believed it. But it was a comfort to feel that she had not, in all likelihood, ruined his life. There were other goddesses, and Roy, according to Dorothy, must needs be worshipping at some shrine. Nevertheless, life was stripped of several more illusions, and Anne began to think drearily that it seemed rather bare. She came down from the porch gable on the evening of her return with a sorrowful face. "'What has happened to the old Snow Queen, Marilla?' "'Oh, I knew you'd feel bad over that,' said Marilla. "'I felt bad myself. That tree was there ever since I was a young girl. It blew down in the big gale we had in March. It was rotten at the core.' "'I'll miss it so,' grieved Anne. "'The porch gable doesn't seem the same room without it. I'll never look from its window again without a sense of loss. And, oh, I never came home to Green Gables before that Diana wasn't here to welcome me." "'Diana has something else to think of just now,' said Mrs. Lynde significantly. "'Well, tell me all the Avonlea news,' said Anne, sitting down on the porch steps, where the evening sunshine fell over her hair in a fine golden rain. "'There isn't much else except what we've wrote you,' said Mrs. Lynde. "'I suppose you haven't heard that Simon Fletcher broke his leg last week?' It's been a great thing for his family. They're getting a hundred things done that they've always wanted to do but couldn't as long as he was about, the old crank." "'He came of an aggravating family,' remarked Marilla. "'Aggravating? Well, rather. His mother used to get up at prayer meeting and tell all her children's shortcomings and ask prayer for them. Of course it made them mad, and worse than ever." "'You haven't told Anne the news about Jane,' suggested Marilla. "'Oh, Jane!' sniffed Mrs. Lynde. Well, she conceded grudgingly, Jane Andrews is home from the West, come last week, and she's going to be married to a Winnipeg millionaire. You may be sure Mrs. Harmon lost no time in telling it far and wide. Dear old Jane, I'm so glad, said Anne heartily. She deserves the good things of life. Oh, I ain't saying anything against Jane. She's a nice enough girl. But she isn't in the millionaire class. And you'll find there's not much to recommend the man but his money, that's what. Mrs. Harmon says he's an Englishman, who has made his money in mines, but I believe he'll turn out to be a Yankee. He certainly must have money, for he has just showered Jane with jewelry. Her engagement ring is a diamond cluster so big that it looked like a plaster on Jane's fat paw. Mrs. Lynde could not keep some bitterness out of her tone. Here was Jane Andrews, that plain little plotter, engaged to a millionaire, 
while Anne, it seemed, was not yet bespoken by anyone, rich or poor, and Mrs. Harmon Andrews did brag insufferably. "'What has Gilbert Blythe been doing to at college?' asked Marilla. "'I saw him when he came home last week, and he is so pale and thin I hardly knew him.' "'He studied very hard last winter,' said Anne. "'You know he took high honors in classics and the Cooper Prize. It hasn't been taken for five years, so I think he's rather run down. We're all a little tired.' "'Anyhow, you're a B.A., and Jane Andrews isn't, and never will be,' said Mrs. Lynde, with gloomy satisfaction. A few evenings later Anne went down to see Jane, but the latter was away in Charlottetown. "'Getting sewing done,' Mrs. Harmon informed Anne proudly. "'Of course an Avonlea dressmaker wouldn't do for Jane under the circumstances.' "'I've heard something very nice about Jane,' said Anne. "'Yes, Jane has done pretty well, even if she isn't a B.A.' said Mrs. Harmon, with a slight toss of her head. "'Mr. Inglis is worth millions, and they're going to Europe on their wedding tour. When they come back they'll live in a perfect mansion of marble in Winnipeg. Jane has only one trouble. She can cook so well, and her husband won't let her cook. He is so rich he hires his cooking done. They're going to keep a cook and two other maids, and a coachman, and a man of all work.' "'But what about you, Anne? I don't hear anything of your being married. After all your college going—' "'Oh,' laughed Anne, "'I'm going to be an old maid. I really can't find anyone to suit me.' It was rather wicked of her. She deliberately meant to remind Mrs. Andrews that if she became an old maid it was not because she had not had at least one chance of marriage. But Mrs. Harmon took swift revenge. "'Well, the over-particular girls generally get left, I notice. And what's this I hear about Gilbert Blythe being engaged to a Miss Stewart? Charlie Sloane tells me she is perfectly beautiful. Is it true?' "'I don't know if it is true that he is engaged to Miss Stewart,' replied Anne, with Spartan composure. "'But it is certainly true that she is very lovely.' "'I once thought you and Gilbert would have made a match of it,' said Mrs. Harmon. If you don't take care, Anne, all of your bows will slip through your fingers. Anne decided not to continue her duel with Mrs. Harmon. You could not fence with an antagonist who met rapier thrust with a blow of battle-axe. Since Jane is away, she said, rising haughtily, I don't think I can stay longer this morning. I'll come down when she comes home. Do, said Mrs. Harmon effusively. Jane isn't a bit proud. She just means to associate with her old friends the same as ever. She'll be real glad to see you." Jane's millionaire arrived the last of May and carried her off in a blaze of splendor. Mrs. Lynde was spitefully gratified to find that Mr. Inglis was every day of forty, and short and thin and grayish. Mrs. Lynde did not spare him in her enumeration of his shortcomings, you may be sure. "'It will take all his gold to gild a pill like him, that's what,' said Mrs. Rachel solemnly. He looks kind and good-hearted, said Anne loyally, and I'm sure he thinks the world of Jane. Huh, <laughs> said Mrs. Rachel. Phil Gordon was married the next week, and Anne went over to Bolingbrook to be her bridesmaid. Phil made a dainty fairy of a bride, and the Reverend Joe was so radiant in his happiness that nobody thought him plain. We're going for a lover's saunter through the land of Evangeline, said Phil, and then we'll settle down on Patterson Street. Mother thinks it is terrible. She thinks Joe might at least take a church in a decent place. But the wilderness of the Patterson slums will blossom like the rose for me, if Joe is there. Oh, Anne, I'm so happy my heart aches with it." Anne was always glad in the happiness of her friends, but it is sometimes a little lonely to be surrounded everywhere by a happiness that is not your own. And it was just the same when she went back to Avonlea. This time it was Diana, who was bathed in the wonderful glory that comes to a woman when her firstborn is laid beside her. Anne looked at the white young mother with a certain awe that had never entered into her feelings for Diana before. Could this pale woman with the rapture in her eyes be the little black-curled, rosy-cheeked Diana she had played with in vanished school days? It gave her a queer, desolate feeling that she herself somehow belonged only in those past years and had no business in the present at all. "'Isn't he perfectly beautiful?' said Diana proudly. The little fat fellow was absurdly like Fred, just as round, just as red. 
Anne really could not say conscientiously that she thought him beautiful, but she vowed sincerely that he was sweet and kissable and altogether delightful. Before he came I wanted a girl, so that I could call her Anne, said Diana. But now that little Fred is here I wouldn't exchange him for a million girls. He just couldn't have been anything but his own precious self. Every little baby is the sweetest and the best, quoted Mrs. Allen gaily. If little Anne had come, you'd have felt just the same about her. Mrs. Allen was visiting in Avonlea for the first time since leaving it. She was as gay and sweet and sympathetic as ever. Her old girl friends had welcomed her back rapturously. The reigning minister's wife was an estimable lady, but she was not exactly a kindred spirit. I can hardly wait till he gets old enough to talk, sighed Diana. I just long to hear him say, Mother. And oh, I'm determined that his first memory of me shall be a nice one. The first memory I have of my mother is of her slapping me for something I had done. I'm sure I deserved it, and Mother was always a good mother, and I love her dearly. But I do wish my first memory of her was nicer. I have just one memory of my mother, and it is the sweetest of all my memories," said Mrs. Allen. I was five years old, and I had been allowed to go to school one day with my two older sisters. When school came out, my sisters went home in different groups, each supposing I was with the other. Instead, I had run off with a little girl I had played with at recess. We went to her home, which was near the school, and began making mud pies. We were having a glorious time when my older sister arrived, breathless and angry. You naughty girl, she cried, snatching my reluctant hand and dragging me along with her. Come home this minute. Oh, you're going to catch it. Mother is awful cross. She's going to give you a good whipping. I had never been whipped. Dread and terror filled my poor little heart. I have never been so miserable in my life as I was on that walk home. I had not meant to be naughty. Phoebe Cameron had asked me to go home with her, and I had not known it was wrong to go. And now I was to be whipped for it. When we got home my sister dragged me into the kitchen, where mother was sitting by the fire in the twilight. My poor wee legs were trembling so that I could hardly stand, and mother, mother, just took me up in her arms, without one word of rebuke or harshness kissed me and held me close to her heart. I was so frightened you were lost, darling, she said tenderly. I could see the love shining in her eyes as she looked down on me. She never scolded or reproached me for what I had done, only told me I must never go away again without asking permission. She died very soon afterwards. That is the only memory I have of her. Isn't it a beautiful one? Anne felt lonelier than ever as she walked home, going by way of the birch path and Willowmere. She had not walked that way for many moons. It was a darkly purple, bloomy night. The air was heavy with blossom fragrance, almost too heavy. The cloyed senses recoiled from it as from an overfull cup. The birches of the path had grown from the fairy saplings of old to big trees. Everything had changed. Anne felt that she would be glad when the summer was over and she was away at work again. Perhaps life would not seem so empty then. "'I've tried the world. It wears no more the colouring of romance it wore,' sighed Anne, and was straightway much comforted by the romance in the idea of the world being denuded of romance. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 A Book of Revelation the Irvings came back to Echo Lodge for the summer, and Anne spent a happy three weeks there in July. Miss Lavender had not changed. Charlotta the Fourth was a very grown-up young lady now, but still adored Anne sincerely. "'When all's said and done, Miss Shirley, ma'am, I haven't seen anyone in Boston that's equal to you,' she said frankly. Paul was almost grown up, too. He was sixteen, his chestnut curls had given place to close-cropped brown locks, and he was more interested in football than fairies. But the bond between him and his old teacher still held. Kindred spirits alone do not change with changing years. It was a wet, bleak, cruel evening in July when Anne came back to Green Gables. One of the fierce summer storms which sometimes sweep over the gulf was ravaging the sea. As Anne came in, the first raindrops dashed against the panes. "'Was that Paul who brought you home?' asked Marilla. "'Why didn't you make him stay all night? It's going to be a wild evening.' "'He'll reach Echo Lodge before the rain gets very heavy, I think. Anyway, he wanted to go back tonight. 
Well, I've had a splendid visit, but I'm glad to see you dear folks again. East, West, Hames, Best. Davy, have you been growing again lately? I've grown a whole inch since you left, said Davy proudly. I'm as tall as Milty Bolter now. Ain't I glad? He'll have to stop crowing about being bigger. Say, Anne, do you know that Gilbert Blythe is dying? Anne stood quite silent and motionless, looking at Davy. Her face had gone so white that Marilla thought she was going to faint. Davy, hold your tongue, said Mrs. Rachel angrily. Anne, don't look like that. Don't look like that. We didn't mean to tell you so suddenly. Is it true? asked Anne, in a voice that was not hers. Gilbert is very ill, said Mrs. Lynde gravely. He took down with typhoid fever just after you left for Echo Lodge. Did you never hear of it? No, said that unknown voice. It was a very bad case from the start. The doctor said he'd been terrible run down. They've a trained nurse, and everything's been done. Don't look like that, Anne. While there's life, there's hope. Mr. Harrison was here this evening, and he said they had no hope of him, reiterated Davy. Marilla, looking old and worn and tired, got up and marched Davy grimly out of the kitchen. Oh, don't look so, dear, said Mrs. Rachel, putting her kind old arms about the pallid girl. I haven't given up hope. Indeed, I haven't. He's got the blithe constitution in his favor, that's what. Anne gently put Mrs. Lynde's arms away from her, walked blindly across the kitchen, through the hall, up the stairs to her old room. At its window she knelt down, staring out unseeingly. It was very dark. The rain was beating down over the shivering fields. The haunted woods was full of the groans of mighty trees wrung in the tempest, and the air throbbed with the thunderous crash of billows on the distant shore. And Gilbert was dying. There is a book of revelation in everyone's life, as there is in the Bible. Anne read hers that bitter night, as she kept her agonized vigil through the hours of storm and darkness. She loved Gilbert, had always loved him. She knew that now. She knew that she could no more cast him out of her life without agony than she could have cut off her right hand and cast it from her and the knowledge had come too late, too late even for the bitter solace of being with him at the last. If she had not been so blind, so foolish, she would have had the right to go to him now. But he would never know that she loved him. He would go away from this life thinking that she did not care. Oh, the black years of emptiness stretching before her! She could not live through them, she could not. She cowered down by her window and wished, for the first time in her gay young life, that she could die, too. If Gilbert went away from her, without one word or sign or message, she could not live. Nothing was of any value without him. She belonged to him and he to her. In her hour of supreme agony she had no doubt of that. He did not love Christine Stewart, never had loved Christine Stewart. Oh, what a fool she had been not to realize what the bond was that had held her to Gilbert! to think that the flattered fancy she had felt for Roy Gardner had been love, and now she must pay for her folly as for a crime. Mrs. Lynde and Marilla crept to her door before they went to bed, shook their heads doubtfully at each other over the silence, and went away. The storm raged all night, but when the dawn came it was spent. Anne saw a fairy fringe of light on the skirts of darkness. Soon the eastern hilltops had a fire-shot ruby rim. The clouds rolled themselves away into great, soft, white masses on the horizon. The sky gleamed blue and silvery. A hush fell over the world. Anne rose from her knees and crept downstairs. The freshness of the rain-wind blew against her white face as she went out into the yard and cooled her dry, burning eyes. A merry, rollicking whistle was lilting up the lane. A moment later Pacifique Buote came in sight. Anne's physical strength suddenly failed her. If she had not clutched at a low willow bough she would have fallen. Pacifique was George Fletcher's hired man, and George Fletcher lived next door to the Blythes. Mrs. Fletcher was Gilbert's aunt. Pacifique would know if—if—Pacifique would know what there was to be known. Pacifique strode sturdily on along the red lane, whistling. He did not see Anne. She made three futile attempts to call him. 
He was almost past before she succeeded in making her quivering lips call, Pacifique! Pacifique turned with a grin and a cheerful good morning. Pacifique, said Anne faintly, did you come from George Fletcher's this morning? Sure, said Pacifique amiably. I got the word last night that my father, he was sick. It was so stormy that I couldn't go then, so I start very early this Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 41 Love Takes Up the Glass of Time I've come up to ask you to go for one of our old-time rambles through September woods and over hills where spices grow this afternoon, said Gilbert, coming suddenly around the porch corner. Suppose we visit Hester Gray's garden? Anne, sitting on the stone step, with her lap full of a pale, filmy green stuff, looked up rather blankly. "'Oh, I wish I could,' she said slowly. "'But I really can't, Gilbert. I'm going to Alice Penhallow's wedding this evening, you know. I've got to do something to this dress, and by the time it's finished I'll have to get ready. I'm so sorry. I'd love to go.' "'Well, can you go tomorrow afternoon, then?' asked Gilbert, apparently not much disappointed. "'Yes, I think so.' In that case, I shall hie me home at once to do something I shall otherwise have to do tomorrow. So, Alice Penhallow is to be married tonight. Three weddings for you in one summer, Anne? Phil's, Alice's, and Jane's. I'll never forgive Jane for not inviting me to her wedding. You really can't blame her when you think of the tremendous Andrews connection who had to be invited. The house could hardly hold them all. I was only bidden by grace of being Jane's old chum, at least on Jane's part. I think Mrs. Harmon's motive for inviting me was to let me see Jane's surpassing gorgeousness. Is it true that you wore so many diamonds that you couldn't tell where the diamonds left off and Jane began? Anne laughed. She certainly wore a good many. What with all the diamonds and white satin and tulle and lace and roses and orange blossoms, prim little Jane was almost lost to sight. But she was very happy and so was Mr. Inglis. And so was Mrs. Harmon. Is that the dress you're going to wear tonight? Asked Gilbert looking down at the fluffs and frills. Yes, isn't it pretty? And I shall wear star flowers in my hair. The haunted wood is full of them this summer. Gilbert had a sudden vision of Anne, arrayed in a frilly green gown, with the virginal curves of arms and throat slipping out of it, and white stars shining against the coils of her ruddy hair. The vision made him catch his breath. But he turned lightly away. Well, I'll be up tomorrow. Hope you'll have a nice time tonight. Anne looked after him as he strode away, and sighed. Gilbert was friendly, very friendly, far too friendly. He had come quite often to Green Gables after his recovery, and something of their old comradeship had returned. But Anne no longer found it satisfying. The rose of love made the blossom of friendship pale and scentless by contrast. And Anne had again begun to doubt if Gilbert now felt anything for her but friendship. In the common light of common day, her radiant certainty of that rapt morning had faded. She was haunted by a miserable fear that her mistake could never be rectified. It was quite likely that it was Christine whom Gilbert loved after all. Perhaps he was even engaged to her. Anne tried to put all unsettling hopes out of her heart, and reconcile herself to a future where work and ambition must take the place of love. She could do good, if not noble, work as a teacher and the success her little sketches were beginning to meet with in certain editorial sanctums augured well for her budding literary dreams. But—but—Anne picked up her green dress and sighed again. When Gilbert came the next afternoon, he found Anne waiting for him, fresh as the dawn and fair as a star, after all the gaiety of the preceding night. She wore a green dress, not the one she had worn to the wedding, but an old one, which Gilbert had told her at a Redmond reception he liked especially. It was just the shade of green that brought out the rich tints of her hair, and the starry gray of her eyes, and the iris-like delicacy of her skin. Gilbert, glancing at her sideways as they walked along a shadowy wood-path, thought she had never looked so lovely. Anne, glancing sideways at Gilbert now and then, thought how much older he looked since his illness. It was as if he had put boyhood behind him forever. The day was beautiful and the way was beautiful. Anne was almost sorry when they reached Hester Gray's garden and sat down on the old bench. But it was beautiful there, too, as beautiful as it had been on the faraway day of the golden picnic, when Diana and Jane and Priscilla and she had found it. Then it had been lovely with narcissus and violets. 
Now goldenrod had kindled its fairy torches in the corners, and asters dotted it bluely. The call of the brook came up through the woods from the valley of birches with all its old allurement. The mellow air was full of the purr of the sea. Beyond were fields rimmed by fences, bleached silvery gray in the suns of many summers, and long hills scarfed with the shadows of autumnal clouds. With the blowing of the west wind, old dreams returned. "'I think,' said Anne softly, "'that the land where dreams come true is in the blue haze yonder, over that little valley.' "'Have you any unfulfilled dreams, Anne?' asked Gilbert. Something in his tone, something she had not heard since that miserable evening in the orchard at Patty's place, made Anne's heart beat wildly. But she made answer lightly. "'Of course. Everybody has. It wouldn't do for us to have all our dreams fulfilled. We would be as good as dead if we had nothing left to dream about. What a delicious aroma that low descending sun is extracting from the asters and ferns. I wish we could see perfumes as well as smell them. I'm sure they would be very beautiful." Gilbert was not to be thus sidetracked. "'I have a dream,' he said slowly. "'I persist in dreaming it, although it has often seemed to me that it could never come true. I dream of a home with a hearth fire in it, a cat and dog, the footsteps of friends, and you." Anne wanted to speak, but she could find no words. Happiness was breaking over her like a wave. It almost frightened her. "'I asked you a question over two years ago, Anne. Uh, if I ask it again today, will you give me a different answer?' Still Anne could not speak. But she lifted her eyes, shining with all the love-rapture of countless generations, and looked into his for a moment. He wanted no other answer. They lingered in the old garden until twilight, sweet as dusk in Eden must have been, crept over it. There was so much to talk over and recall, things said and done and heard and thought and felt and misunderstood. "'I thought you loved Christine Stewart,' Anne told him, as reproachfully as if she had not given him every reason to suppose that she loved Roy Gardner. Gilbert laughed boyishly. <laughs> Christine was engaged to somebody in her hometown. I knew it, and she knew I knew it. When her brother graduated, he told me his sister was coming to Kingsport the next winter to take music, and asked me if I would look after her a bit, as she knew no one and would be very lonely, and so I did. And then I liked Christine for her own sake. She's one of the nicest girls I've ever known. I knew college gossip credited us with being in love with each other. I didn't care. Nothing mattered much to me for a time there after you told me you could never love me, Anne. There was nobody else. There never could be anybody else for me but you. I've loved you ever since that day you broke your slate over my head in school." "'I don't see how you could keep on loving me when I was such a little fool,' said Anne. "'Well, I tried to stop,' said Gilbert frankly. "'Not because I thought you what you call yourself, but because I felt sure there was no chance for me after Gardner came on the scene. But I couldn't, and I can't tell you either what it meant to me these two years to believe you're going to marry him and be told every week by some busybody that your engagement was on the point of being announced. I believed it until one blessed day when I was sitting up after the fever. I got a letter from Phil Gordon, well, F Phil Blake, rather, in which she told me there was really nothing between you and Roy and advised me to try again. Well, the doctor was amazed at my rapid recovery after that." Anne laughed, then shivered. I can never forget the night I thought you were dying, Gilbert. Oh, I knew, I knew then, and I thought it was too late. But it wasn't, sweetheart. Oh, and this makes up for everything, doesn't it? Let's resolve to keep this day sacred to perfect beauty all our lives for the gift it has given us." "'It's the birthday of our happiness,' said Anne softly. I've always loved this old garden of Hester Gray's, and now it will be dearer than ever." "'But I'll have to ask you to wait a long time, Anne,' said Gilbert sadly. "'It will be three years before I'll finish my medical course. And even then there will be no diamond sunbursts and marble halls." Anne laughed. "'I don't want sunbursts and marble halls. I just want you. You see I'm quite as shameless as Phil about it. Sunbursts and marble halls may be all very well, but there is more scope for imagination without them. And as for the waiting, that doesn't matter. We'll just be happy, waiting and working for each other. And dreaming. Oh, dreams will be very sweet now. Gilbert drew her close to him and kissed her. Then they walked home together in the dusk, 
crowned king and queen in the bridal realm of love, along winding paths fringed with the sweetest flowers that ever bloomed, and over haunted meadows where winds of hope and memory blew. End of chapter 41 End of Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery